morning, everybody, and uh, can I add my welcome to, to Gordon's? It's fantastic to see you, and well done for braving the snow. Put up your hands if you're excited about the snow. Put up your hands if you hate snow. Okay, well, a mixed bag there, but what, particularly those who hate snow, well done for making it along. As I said, my name's Andy, I'm a minister here at CCB, and, and today's an unusual service in, in many respects, not just because it's snowing, not just because we're meeting in a slightly cold, ugly sports hall, um, but because... Uh, Today we're doing two uh, unusual things. Uh, we are witnessing the confirmation of Josh and Connor, and also later at the end of the service, as uh, Gordon's already said, uh, we'll be licensing uh, Johnny as a, as a lay reader in the church. Now, some of you might wonder, what on earth are some of those things? Well, let me, let me uh, explain what this is a, a little bit about. And um, the Bible says uh, that baptism is the essential first stage of beginning uh, to follow Jesus. It, it symbolises our, our union with Christ, uh, dying with him in his death and being raised with him uh, to new life. And this baptism is a sign primarily from God to us uh, rather than our declaration uh, from us to him. And so in, in keeping with uh, the pattern which we see throughout the whole Bible in the Old Testament, um, here at CCB, we baptise not just uh, adult believers, uh, but also uh, children of believers, holding that infants should be raised as followers of Jesus Christ in the church family, uh, rather than unbelievers who are outside the church family who might potentially opt in. Uh, that's the way we kind of do things here. Which kind of leads us to confirmation. Uh, confirmation, uh, whilst not something which we read about uh, in the Bible, is a really good and ancient tradition which allows those who were baptised as infants an opportunity to confirm for themselves those good promises which were made on their behalf when they were children. And it's a chance also for the church to celebrate God's faithfulness to us as we hear how God has been faithful to those promises from children all the way through uh, to adulthood. It's also an opportunity for, for people to formally reassert their um, commitment to the wider church. So we here at CCB, we're not all that there is. We belong to, belong to a wider body, uh, the, church, uh, the Free Church of England. And confirmation is, is a chance for individuals to, to reassert their commitment to that wider body. And Bishop Paul, who's here this morning from the Midlands, he, he represents uh, the Free Church of England for us. And if you're from a, from a free church or a Baptist a tradition, you might wonder, well, what, what are bishops all about? Well, you might know in the Bible um, how, uh, uh, how Titus and Timothy had the responsibility to look after those collection of churches in, uh, in Crete and Ephesus. Well, that's what Bishop Paul is to us. He, he oversees us in terms of faith and discipline. And we're grateful for him uh, joining us today. I think later on we'll have a chance to interview you. Uh, but for the time being, I would like to invite up Josh and Connor, wherever they are, and um, we really want to hear their stories, stories of God's faithfulness to us, and, uh, and uh, what, Josh, do you want to go first? Yeah, go I think here's the X, for those watching at home, you can stand there. So, uh, first of all, thank you for everyone who's able to come today, uh, whether it be online or here, thank you for tuning in, and... It's tipping down the snow, so thank you for actually being able to come today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Josh and I've been a student here at CCB for two years now. And if you asked me before uni if I'd ever be in this position, uh, position I probably would have laughed at you. Because it was the last thing I probably would have thought I'd be. But um, whilst growing up I'd always been interested in uh, knowing about the Lord, knowing the things he does and what he does for us. And I was always that person going around in school who'd say they're a Christian because I was christened when I was a child and I never knew the true reason what it would meant to be a Christian. Uh, but throughout growing up, I'd always been intrigued and interested in learning more about faith and I just never had the confidence to do so fully. Uh, I guess that's because I was probably worried about what other people might think of me for doing that. But um, when I was a child and uh, crying and whatnot, uh, I recall myself just running up to my room and just praying for little silly things not knowing who, I was, who and what I was praying towards. Um, in uh, religious education lessons, uh, at school I'd always ask questions. I have a good family friend who's a Christian, I'd always ask her questions. But I'd never actually 
go towards it and actually figure it out for myself uh, because of those reasons. Um, and that was until I came to uni. Uh, I entered the flat with five other people and two of them who were unashamed and loved to know that God loved them and loved to happily say that they go to church and they live their life in the way that God wants us to. And um, considering I'm a, I'm a very last minute person and even with uni I was the same throughout and even with accommodation it was on the deadline that I decided to book my accommodation place and the fact that I entered a flat with these, uh, with these two uh, that went to church and also with uh, links to the Christian faith within the other three. If that was a sign from God to tell me that this was the right thing for me, I honestly don't know what is. So I explored more and I came to CCB and, and that was the carol service in my first year and I've never stopped coming since. Um, so I began exploring the claims of Jesus, funnily enough, with Connor, <laughs> reading, reading the Bible, reading through Mark, and it amazed me how relatable it was to our lives. For me, for instance, for example, there's a story that Jesus told about a farmer uh, with different types of soil, and how each sow a seed in these different types of soils. And it amazed me just which soil linked to me most. And one of the soils that uh, was sowed in was the rocky soil, in which was people who like to hear about Jesus, are interested, but end up don't following him, or don't end up finding more about him, or finding out more about him, because of what people might think of them. And I realized that was me, that was the rocky soil was me. And the more I came to church, the more I made so many good friends, so many more uh, friends here, and the more God was opening up my heart in learning more about him, and I was beginning to see how amazing it was that God actually loved me, uh, despite how I've been so distant from him for all these years. Uh, the big turning point for me was when I went to a Christian camp in 2019 called Soul Survivor. Uh, I didn't have massive, massive expectations, and I just wanted to learn more. But what struck me was how people were genuinely emotionally connected with God. It was obvious from their singing that they loved Jesus for what he had done for them by dying on the cross in their place. At first, I thought their display of emotion was quite weird. But um, that evening, I got it. It was walking into that tent, just being intrigued, just how I've always been. And it was within that meeting, all those years of pushing God away, not listening, came back at me at once. I'm not one to cry in front of people. And I broke down in tears in front of people I'd probably met for the first time just being there. And that was from the Lord actually loving me, forgiving me and actually wanting to be with me. So I walked out of that tent reborn and happy to say I was a Christian. So that was two years ago now. Uh, since then I've kept growing up. I've kept growing an understanding about what it means to live life as a Christian, in particular what priorities to put first in life. In all honesty, I'm no longer worried about what people think of me with, in regards to faith. I guess I've gotten over that now. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, all that matters is what God thinks of me. Uh, so, I love my family so much. I probably don't tell them enough, but I do. And since Christ, I've gained a whole new family within the church and also in Jersey. Um, so, uh, yeah, and they're all people that I hope remain in my life forever. But, Give a round of applause. Nice. Um, hey everyone, I'm Connor. Um, oh yeah. Um, hey everyone, I'm Connor. I've been part of CCU for a little while now. Um, so, because I've been here for a while, I think I've, I've told my testimony a, a number of times in different places and no doubt will again. So I wanted to just spend a couple of moment, moments uh, saying something a little bit different, but hopefully you'll see that it's um, in line. Um, recently I found out my dad, when I was baptised, um, wrote a diary entry. Um, and I thought I'd just read out two little things. Um, for some information, the vicar who baptised me was also called Andy. He, my dad wrote this. Um, well, it was just a brilliant baptism. It was a great advert for bolt baptism. 
Connor was full of dignity. There you go. Who knew? Um, and had a good go at strangling Andy with the time mark. I won't do that today. Um, after that, he, he actually, uh, my dad is creative, and he wrote a poem. And I wondered if I could just read some of it out. Um, it went like this. I loved you when you caused your mother nine months of discomfort and five hours of agony. I loved you when you first appeared bloody, delicate, our jewel and our delight. I loved you when you lay in hospital, the hospital bed, fighting for breath as you now fight your sister. I love you when your bowels work but your nappy doesn't. <laughs> I'll love you always, but please remember when you're holding my hand, leave the other hand spare for the one who made you and I and loves you too. I, I think that's quite a beautiful picture of what baptism is. And it has also turned out to be very much my story. My parents and many other people have held my hand and guided me, but now I know the Lord has too. I am privileged that my parents love me, and I guess the biggest and best way they have loved me is pointed to the one who made me. Um, at a child baptism, you know, the parents make some promises. They pray, they, they promise to support children as they bring, begin their journey of faith. They promise to help them live and grow in God's family, and they promise to pray for them and help them to follow Christ. It is a joy to say my parents have kept those promises. And a whole load of other people have joined in those promises too. So I want to take this time to say thank you. Thank you to all those who have held my hand along the way. Thank you for those at Sunny Hill, Matt and Rick. Thank you for everyone at CCB um, who took in an arrogant little medical student. So I'm getting confirmed today because I thoroughly believe in God's grace his work on the cross to save me from wrath because of my sins. I also thoroughly believe I'm doing that today, not because, just because of some decision I made, but because of the faithful guidance and prayers of many friends, of, m of my family, and of my church family. So I want to say thank you God for saving me, and thank you for giving me all the people that you did it through. Thanks. Come on, invite Bishop Paul up. And Bishop Paul's now going to examine you, and uh, then he's going to confirm the faith which is in you. Can I clip that on you? I haven't taken my mask off yet because I just wanted to show people at home. It says Bishop Paul. <laughs> <laughs> it's just in case I forget who I am. Which I would quite often <laughs> occasion to do. Joshua and Connor, do you, in the presence of God and in this congregation, renew the solemn promises made at your baptism? Do you confirm that you repent your sins and renounce evil? that you sincerely believe and trust in Christ and that you will faithfully obey God all the days of your life. I do. I do. I didn't hear you. I do. Thank you. <laughs> they do. Let us pray that God will strengthen with his Holy Spirit those who now confirm their commitment to those promises made at their baptism, and that they will serve Christ the Lord faithfully all their days. Let's pray. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose grace these your servants have been born again of water and the Spirit, and have received forgiveness of all their sins, strengthen them with the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, daily increase in them your gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of guidance, 
and strength, the spirit of knowledge and true godliness, and fill them, O Lord, with the spirit of your holy fear, both now and forever. Amen. Defend, O Lord, your servant Joshua with your heavenly grace, that he may continue yours forever and daily increase in your Holy Spirit until he comes to your eternal kingdom. Amen. Amen. The essential thing. It's hair conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> Not that he needs it at all. <laughs> Defend, O oh Lord, your servant Connor with your heavenly grace, that he may continue yours forever and daily increase in your Holy Spirit until he comes to your eternal kingdom. Amen. Let us pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Almighty and ever-living God, you teach us both to intend and to do those things that are good and acceptable in your sight. We humbly pray for these your servants, upon whom we have laid our hands, following the example of your holy apostles. Reassure them of your favour and goodness. Let your fatherly hand always be over them. May your Holy Spirit be ever with them. Lead them into all truth and teach them to obey your word so that in the end they obtain eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Inside there, you have your certificate <laughs> to make sure proof that you've been done. <laughs> and may I just thank you both for your testimonies, uh, most moving, and uh, I certainly enjoyed doing them. And also, you've got a free Church of England prayer book. <laughs> Hold on, make sure I give the right one to the right person. Connor, it's yours. There you go. And that was you, Joshua. Bless you both. Thank you very much. Well, we have a chance to hear, to listen to, to reflect on a great song that reminds us that the glory is all to Christ for saving us, for keeping us going in the Christian life as we live it here until he takes us home, and then the promise of the future in heaven with him. Uh, it's cold in here. I hope it's warm, nice and warm for you all at home. It's cold in here. So if you'd like to stand up and just move around a little bit and feel a little bit warmer while the band sing, uh, please feel free to do that. Tom, thank you. On the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry, 
he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord said to the bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, and I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Our second reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2, um, on page 881. That's Ephesians chapter 2 on page 881, and we will start reading from verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised, raised up with us with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ in order that in the coming of ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is a gift of God not by works so that no one can boast for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared us in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma, for reading so well. There's two readings, one very strange dream vision. And the other, the New Testament reading, which we'll be following together, uh, sort of explaining uh, something what's going on there. Um, if you're new, what I'd love you to do, if you've joined us perhaps for the first time, is open up your Bible back to Ephesians chapter 1. That's page 881. You should have a Bible on your chair. You'll need it open because your job is to make sure that what I'm saying is what Paul has written. It's what God has said through the scriptures. So please keep your Bibles open. It's page 881. And if, like me, um, you, you struggle to pay attention, um, you might find a pen around. There's a little outline in the service sheet 
which give you an idea of where I'm going to go over the next few moments. It may help you to jot down notes. And, and as uh, Gordon mentioned earlier, we have a grill a question later. So it may be something I say is going to provoke questions in you, and we want to hear your questions. And, and tonight we'll be able to do that. Uh, so do, uh, do jot any questions or thoughts down uh, as I'm speaking. But it's page 881, Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, that's, uh, that's what I'll be speaking on. Why don't I uh, pray to God? Our Father God, thank you for the beauty of your world. Thank you for the snow outside. And thank you for gathering us here this morning and a chance to uh, see your new creation in the lives of Josh and Connor in particular. Lord, we love you. We want to know more about you. So whoever you are here today, Lord, whether we've been trusting in Jesus for many years or whether we're not yet trusting in Jesus, I pray, Father, that you would open up our eyes and see our need for a resurrection, a new life. In Jesus' name, amen. I read this week about a stand-up comic who was uh, speaking to a sold-out arena. But what made this evening slightly unusual, slightly strange for him, is that this was the very first time his parents had ever come to see him perform. And it, there they were, I think they're sitting on the third or fourth row, and he, he began his set by giving them a shout out. And th this comedian, he, he's particularly well known for his, his coarse language. And uh, his parents are slightly well to do, so he had to prepare them for this. Uh, so he said, I just want to warn you, mum and dad, that my set has some words in it which you may not have ever heard before. And quick as a flash, his dad shouted out, might one of those words be thank you by any chance? Now, I've got three kids of my own. You might have seen them very briefly at the start of this service. And, and I know how difficult it is to squeeze gratitude out of them. It is very hard indeed. Partly, that's because they have no sense of value. You buy them a big, expensive gift, and they take more interest in the cardboard box it came in. They also have no uh, sense of danger. Just the other day, Caleb, my three-year-old, was cycling along. He fell into the road, truck coming along. I dived into the road, walled him back out, and he was furious at me. <laughs> you really scared me, Dad. Why on earth did you do that? He has no sense of danger, no sense of gratitude. And the other thing, kids have, have a sense of deep sense, uh, sense self of entitlement. Now, we, we, um, Saturday's my day off, Daddy's day off, and we often go to McDonald's, and now on a day off when we don't take them to the Scottish restaurant, they get furious. It is our right. Why aren't we going to McDonald's today? They just can't get it. They think it's something which is theirs, which is earned by them. How dare you deny me McDonald's, says Caleb, my three-year-old. Well, a moment ago, um, Connor and Josh, they expressed their heartfelt gratitude to God, their Heavenly Father, uh, for the gift of Jesus Christ, for the gift of salvation, for forgiveness of their sins. And it might be that we're here today, perhaps at a friend or a guest, and, and you just don't get it. You, you don't understand what, why, why they're so grateful. Maybe like my own kids, we might wonder, is Jesus Christ really that valuable? Surely there are other things in this world which are far more worthy of our attention and time than, than Jesus Christ. We, we, we don't share their sense of value. We might also not share their sense of danger. The idea of we confessed our sins earlier, sin, we might think, well, is, is that really such a bigger deal? Why, need, why do we need salvation from that? Why do we need forgiveness from that? We, we, we don't sense, share their sense of danger. But also, we might have that deep-seated sense of entitlement that we think well salvation surely it's coming my way anyway I'm a good person we might think after all God has to forgive isn't, isn't that his job we feel entitled but it's not just people who aren't yet Christian who might think that way I think even followers of Jesus Christ people have been Christians for years, we, we might simply fall into assuming the Christian faith. Yes, 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 should we say, yes, Jesus died for my sins, yes, 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 but how easily we become ungrateful children, how quickly we become unmoved by this precious gift of life. 
forgetting the value, forgetting the danger we were in, and feeling a sense of entitlement. The Apostle Paul is writing here in this passage, which is open in front of you, he's writing to a bunch of Christians living in modern day Turkey in, in Ephesus. In our passage, it, it's like he's holding up before our faces a really unflattering photograph, an old photograph. Well, you know, where you've got weird teeth and you've got an 80s haircut and bad clothes. And it's very unflattering. And, and, and the Apostle Paul's holding up this photo before us. And he's saying, look, this is what we were all once like. You'll see from your handouts, we're going to begin by learning that we were all once dead. Dead in sin. Follow with me at verse 1. Look down. Paul writes, As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Now, dead is a pretty bleak diagnosis, isn't it? You went to the doctor and he said, yeah, I know what's wrong with you. You're dead. You know, that, that's like the worst possible news you could get from a doctor, isn't it? He, he doesn't say that you're, you're, kind of, you're feeling a bit peaky. He, he doesn't say you, you're a bit sick. He doesn't even say you're at death's door. He says you're dead. Now, we might be tempted to dismiss this as just a ridiculous exaggeration. I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm very much alive. Thank you very much. But let's not miss the point of this metaphor. Being dead means we're utterly, utterly powerless. I read in the news this week of a Romanian court which ruled that a 63-year-old man was legally dead despite the fact that he was standing in front of the judge giving him evidence to the contrary. Uh, Konstantin Riliu left Romania for Turkey in 1992 and he cut off all contact with his family at that point. And in 2020, he then returned back home to his family only to discover his wife had declared him legally dead two years previously. He tried to have his death certificate annulled, but the court ruled he was too late to do that. So now he's officially dead. And since the ruling was final, he'll have to stay dead. He said this to the newspapers. I have no income, and because I'm listed dead, I can't do anything. It's a ridiculous story, but, but, but that's the point which the Apostle Paul makes. He's making here in verse 1 about our, our spiritual lives. He says, we're utterly powerless. We're dead. Why, why, why is that? Because just like Constantine Rilio cutting off contact with his family, well, so how each of us, we've cut off contact with our Creator. And if you cut off contact from the source of all being and life, well, you, you're dead. You're dead. Paul uses two words here to describe in verse 1 our spiritual death, transgressions and sin. Sin is our, our kind of our failure to love God and love one another the way which we know we ought to do. We all know we should, but we, we don't. Transgressions is our deliberate attempts to go beyond what we know is right, to go beyond what we know God has said is good. Now, in the ears of our culture, we struggle with that, don't we? We, uh, we think rebelliousness, it, it sounds really cool, doesn't it? it? It sounds very attractive. We like to think it's better to be free and in control of our, of our own destiny. But as Paul continues, he shows that sin isn't liberating, but controlling. We aren't independent, free spirits. We are, in fact, slavish followers. Just don't take my word for it. Look again at verse 1. Follow with me. Verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to uh, live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires. And thoughts. Being dead 
in sin. There are three things which, which Paul says by nature we, we slavishly follow. Three things which we follow. Maybe thinkingly, maybe unthinkingly. Paul says we're followers. We follow the ways of the world. We follow the lies of the devil. And we follow the cravings of our flesh. We're followers. I don't know if you like those... Um, human planet documentaries they came out after a planet earth with david attenborough and then they thought well, we should probably concentrate on the humans for once and they, they started following around some interesting people groups and and uh, one of the people groups they followed were the inuit people it's, as they live in the in the arctic circle and it showed very vividly about how they live and how they survive and, and in particular there's a scene about how they catch wolves what they do is they take a, a razor sharp knife and then they dip it in seal's blood until it freezes. And then they do it again to create another layer of seal's blood. And another layer, and another layer. Until it's like this sort of bloody lollipop. Mm. And, then, and then they jam the, 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 the knife, um, hilt down, with the blade pointing upwards in a snowdrift. And then they simply walk away. And overnight, a wolf would be attracted to the smell of the blood. And it would begin to lick the knife, enjoying the, the taste of the seal's blood. It's a free meal. This is good, he says to himself. But soon he gets frustrated with the limited payout and begins to lick quicker and quicker and harder and harder. And eventually the wolf is delighted because the blood is starting to flow and really flow. But by this point, his, his tongue is so numbed to the cold, he doesn't realise what he's doing. And as he gets weaker and weaker with the loss of blood... His appetite gets stronger and stronger. And when the hunters return the next day, they find one dead wolf. It's a gruesome story. Probably not what you signed up for this morning. But I think it powerfully illustrates the point which Paul's making here in these verses. A trap has been set for us by our spiritual enemy, who is real. He suggests to us that these really good things in life, the good things which God has given to us, good things like, like wealth or, or our jobs or our hobbies or our passions or our freedoms, these good things, our enemy says, you should live for them. You should worship them. These, these good things should be worshipped as God things. And so the devil lies to us and the world around us lies to us also. They tell us that if we give ourselves to these things, well, they'll offer us life. They'll offer us meaning and satisfaction and, and freedom. And so we lick away at these things, unthinkingly following everyone else around us, unaware of all the dead corpses. But ironically, as some of us might here know, these things end up enslaving us and entrapping us but being numb to the dangers and craving for more, we just keep on going until our spiritual death. I guess the weakness with that, that illustration is that it makes us sound simply like victims. We are victims, but we're also offenders. We're also miserable offenders, as the words of our confession earlier on put it. We're sinners who don't love God as we ought. We're sinners who don't love one another as we ought. We're, we're, we're people who go beyond what even our own consciences tell us is right and wrong. We, even, we throw that out the window, let alone what our God thinks. We are sinners, not just victims. And what that means, therefore, is the verdict in verse 3. Did you see that? It's quite startling. Verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its de de desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Wrath is the Bible's word for God's righteous, fair, settled anger. By nature, if we're just left to our own devices, this is our eternal destiny. Death. That's what I deserve. 
That's what Bishop Paul deserves. That's what you deserve. I appreciate this. Again, this isn't what you signed up for this morning. You thought this morning would be fun and upbeat and get to celebrate with Connor and Josh and hooray. And we, we didn't want this, did we? This, this spiritual diagnosis, well, it, it isn't uplifting, is it? It isn't popular. It isn't going to make me any friends. In fact, it's a bit depressing. No, this isn't what we want to hear. It's not what we want to hear. But ask yourself this. Could it be what you need to hear? In January of last year, there's a doctor in the Wuhan city, in the city of Wuhan in China, who discovered this strange new virus. It was spreading uncontrollably, causing people to die. And Dr. Li Wenlang quickly began warning people about the danger. This made him incredibly unpopular. In fact, the government tried to silence him. They tried to ridicule him. They tried to isolate him. But he didn't go quiet. And not only nor did he uh, go into hiding. No, instead of, being, instead of doing that, motivated by a loving concern, he kept on warning people about this. And he kept on treating people with those who had these symptoms. And he himself, in the end, succumbed to the virus. That's what Paul's doing here. He takes no joy in holding up this ugly, unflattering photograph to our face. But we need to see... We need to see how bad our problem is if we're ever going to seek a solution. Yes, he's offering a bleak diagnosis. We are dead in sin. But he only does that so that we might run to the one person who may be able to save us. Because Paul wants us to be made alive in Christ. So look at verse 4. This is the good news. We've done the bad news. Now is the good news. Verse 4. But, but, it's a great word. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Now notice how the solution starts. It, it doesn't begin with us. It begins with God. It's not just that we needed to wake up and come to our senses. It's not just that we needed a bit of help. It's not just that we needed to try a little bit harder to be slightly better people. No. We were dead. As dead as those dry bones in our first reading. Can't do anything. We have no innate power within us to save ourselves. And yet... Whilst we were still dead, verse 4, God loved us. He loved us with a great love. Out of the infinite riches of his love, he, he poured out us two things, mercy and grace. Mercy is, um, is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. We deserve his wrath. Mercy is when he withholds it. And grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve salvation. And yet, in grace, he gives up to us. How? How did he do this, we might ask? Well, it, it cost him dearly. He had to, in verse 5, unite us with Jesus Christ, his son. Now, you might not notice it first when we read it, and maybe you're familiar with this passage, you've never really thought about it, but the imagery behind this verse is in fact completely grotesque. It's, it's borrowed from, uh, from Roma to Roman torture. So the Romans, they uh, sometimes compelled a prisoner to be bound face to face with a human corpse. They had to carry this corpse around with them, bound to it, until the reek and the rot of the dead body would, would destroy the life of, of the living person. The poet Virgil described the punishment like this. The living and the dead at his command were coupled face to face and hand to hand, till choked with stench, 
In loathed embraces tied, the lingering wretches pined away and died. You've probably never thought about this before, but our Creator God, seeing us in our spiritual death, He didn't turn away in disgust. He didn't just fling us into the, into the fires of incineration. No. Instead, he himself took on human flesh and became as one of us. And seeing that we were dead in transgressions and sin, he chose to come forward and embrace us. More than that, to bind himself to us in our death. And on the cross, that's exactly what happened. Despite having no sin of his own, he suffered our death for us. Our sin was punished in his body. And it was dealt with there once and for all. That's what Josh and Connor were celebrating a moment ago, that they're forgiven, that they are loved. Because they're bound to Christ's death. But Jesus didn't stay dead. No, he also came back to life again, which means anyone trusting in him is also made alive with Christ. They have a, a new start. They have a new life. Which is why we're celebrating with Josh and Connor today that they, are, they have a new beginning, despite their sin. In fact, according to verse 6, the, the Christian salvation is so certain, it's so secure, that, that it's almost as if we're already in heaven with Christ. Did you, did you notice that as, a, as Emma read it a moment ago? Christ is in heaven now, he's seated victorious over the world, the flesh and the devil, but, and we, but here we are here, but look at verse 6, it says our future destiny is so certain, it's, it's spoken of here as past tense. Verse 6 it says, and God raised us up with Christ. And seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Just like my kids who struggle with gratitude. So we too, we struggle with gratitude, don't we? We struggle because we don't see the danger. We struggle because we don't see the cost. We struggle because we think we're entitled. But do you see the danger now? Do you see what price Jesus paid that you might be saved? Do you see that salvation is not entitled and yet it is given to you entirely free and without cost? This is a, a debt of love which we could never, ever pay back. In fact, those of us trusting Jesus, this will be our eternity forever, praising God for his unfathomable riches of his kindness towards us. We weren't saved as an end in itself. We weren't saved in order that we might be saved. We were saved in order that we might go, wow, how much, how great are you for loving me? You might be wondering, well, what about now? What, what does this mean for Josh and Connor and for those of us who are trusting Jesus? What, what does this mean for how we should live now? Well, that's where we're going lastly. We were dead in sin. We've been made alive in Christ. But now we're called to walk in grace. Verse 8, look down with me. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is, this faith is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now people like boasting about all sorts of things, don't they? Particularly online, on social media. People love boasting about their charitable endeavours. Uh, people love boasting about their, their political affiliations, particularly their, who they're against politically. Uh, people like to uh, boast about their green credentials and how their work credentials and all sorts of things. More than ever, a world loves boasting in self-righteousness. And the flip side of that coin is therefore they love pouring scorn on anyone who disagrees with them. 
Well, this is the world we're now in, right? But even Christians, even people who say that they've been saved by grace alone, re- reality is we, we too are tempted to boast. The Ephesian church, we can discover in this series that we're very much a mixed bunch. There's a, a mixture of religious people with Jewish backgrounds and a mixture of people with pagan Gentile backgrounds. And, and, and the danger was that these guys were, were beginning to boast in their religiosity, boast in their backgrounds, boast in their freedoms. And to think that therefore they are superior than, than the other. See, so followers of Jesus, we, we may we may very easily be tempted to slip into this way of thinking. To boast, into our, boast in our moral superiority because, of course, following Jesus, we don't get drunk. And we don't sleep around. We might be tempted to boast in our historical superiority because this, our faith, is the one which undergirds the West. We might be tempted to boast in our intellectual superiority because we have the truth. But Paul is writing here in verses 8 and 9 to say to these Christians, you have nothing to boast about. Everything you have, even your faith, that decision to put your trust in Jesus, even that was given to you by God. And this truth that that we're saved by grace alone, it's what separates Christianity from literally every other worldview or religion. There's nothing else like this. Grace is is incredibly humbling, but it's also incredibly liberating. Christians, we don't have to live in guilt, wondering, will I be forgiven for that thing in the past? We don't have to live in fear, wondering, have I done enough? Because we can look at Jesus Christ's death, we can look at his resurrection and know it it is finished. It's all been dealt with. Gabrielle Carey is, a, is an Australian author. You may have heard of her. She wrote a best-selling uh, book, co, uh, uh, co-wrote it, I should say, called Puberty Blues. But in a later book called In My Father's House, she relates an incident which led her to put her trust in Jesus. It's interesting. Carey herself was raised in an atheistic, humanistic background. Her father was a, a university lecturer with a passionate commitment to the political left. And throughout her upbringing, he he rallied against oppression and capitalism and the Vietnam War. And he also rallied against God and and the church, finding it impossible to believe in God with so much suffering in the world. But all of that left Gabrielle feeling tremendously burdened. In a book, in, in my father's house, this is what she writes. One of the hardest aspects of growing up as the daughter of a humanist was the worry of having to live up to the incredibly high intellectual and moral standards. And worse, what happened when it was discovered that you hadn't? Would you be given a second chance? Could you confess your weaknesses? Would you ever be forgiven? What would my father say if he found out I was just another brainless, mind-moulded, media-manipulated failure to humanity? And it was this burden of guilt which led Gabrielle to convert to Jesus Christ. She goes, perhaps what I liked most about Christianity was knowing I could be wrong. Knowing that that even if I behave badly, awfully in fact, that I'll still be loved. That all I needed to do was own up and I'd be forgiven. At least with the Christian Father, the Christian God. You could fail without feeling that it was the end of all hope. That was such a relief to me. You might be wondering then, well, is, is the Christian faith just a get-out-of-jail-free card? Can we just walk around murdering people, doing horrible things and going, ah, I trust in Jesus, hey, is, is, is that what this is about? Well, no, absolutely not. Uh, look at verse 10, a final verse. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now the Greek word that Paul uses here for for handiwork is is best translated masterpiece. It's the Greek word where we get the word poem from, poema, masterpiece. It's a piece of art. 
Now, looking at Josh and Connor, you might not look at them and think they're a piece of art. I doubt any of you have ever thought that, looking at them. But God looks at them and says, they're my masterpiece. More than the snow. More than the mountains. More than the distant nebula. What God has done in Connor and Josh is his masterpiece. Because he's made them anew. They were dead. He breathed life into them. Now they're alive. They're his masterpiece. He's created them. And because he's created them, it means they're not free to just live as they want now. They've not been saved by their works, but they've been saved in order to do good works and to walk in them. I'll close with this story. There was um, once an American who, this is the time of the American Civil War, and it was a Yankee, and he was down south in New, or New Orleans. And he came across in the Market Square slave auction. And uh, there, a, a mixed race girl was, was on the stand, and, and uh, she, people were bidding for her. She was uh, her young age, she was very skilled, and she was very beautiful, and so she attracted a large number of bids. But just before the auctioneer landed his hammer on the gavel, the Yankee, he, he, threw up, he threw his hand up and he threw out this outrageously high bid for this young girl. Um, he made payment for the, the woman and, and he promised next day to come pick her up from her house. And this he did. He knocked on the door, he opened it up. And it was clear that this girl had been crying all night. She was in floods of tears. She was afraid to leave all she knew slavery on this plantation and she was afraid to go with this stranger who she'd only just met but the man presented her with, with, with this piece of paper she obviously wasn't able to read so he read it to her he explained this piece of paper was her freedom she was free she said what do you mean do you mean I'm, I'm free to, to do whatever I want yes you're free he said you mean I'm free to say whatever I want? Yes, you're free. You mean I'm free to go wherever I want? Yes, you're free. And with tears of joy in her eyes, she says, then I'm going to go with you. Friends, if you've understood what I've been saying today, if you've understood what God has been saying to you today, how you were once in slavery to sin, worse, dead in sin, and yet he has brought you, he has redeemed you, he has made you alive. You are not your own. But don't you now want to serve him with your freedom? Don't you now want to live his way? Live in the truth? That's what we've been praying for Connor and Josh a moment ago. And I'd like to pray that for you too. Maybe here today and you're not yet trusting in Jesus. And you might want to make my prayer your own prayer. And I'll pray it slowly and in the quietness of your own heart. You might want to echo it in your own. And ask God to forgive you and to unite you with Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for making me. Thank you for giving me everything that I have. I'm sorry for how I've worshipped these good things in my life as though they are God and have ignored you. I'm sorry for sinning against you and for going against your ways. Thank you for your love for me in Jesus Christ. Thank you that Jesus bound himself to me in my spiritual death and made me alive with him by his resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that even though I did nothing to deserve this, you love me. Help me now to follow you, to walk in the good works that you have prepared for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the band up. And um, I'm going to invite you to stand.
as they, uh, as they play. And reflect on these words in your own heart. You might want to follow along on the service sheet and see the words they're, they're singing. And um, perhaps you want to make this prayer your own prayer as they sing. I want you now to uh, stand together as they play. And, um, and we invite Bishop Paul up and, and Johnny. And we're now going to recognise him and licence him as a lay reader uh, in this church. It's not something we do every week, but something which we love to do, to recognise people's gifts to us. Bishop, I present to you Jonathan Burgess from Christchurch Ballon to be admitted to the office of reader. Is he of Christian character, well versed in the Holy Scriptures and in the doctrines of our faith? He is. Has he been sufficiently prepared for the duties of this office? He has. Brothers and sisters, we propose to admit Jonathan to the office of reader. If anyone knows any reason why he ought not to be so appointed, let them come forth in the name of God and declare the same. Are you sure? <laughs> Johnny, do you trust that you were inwardly moved by the Holy Spirit to take upon you this office, to serve God for his glory and the edifying of his people? I trust so. Do you believe all the canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? I do believe them. The duties of a reader in the church in which he shall serve is to assist the minister in worship when required, and also to read and instruct out of the Holy Scriptures when decided to do so. Will you do this gladly and willingly? I will do so by the help of God. Will you obey your bishop? I'll say that again. <laughs> Will you obey your bishop and other chief ministers of the church and those to whom the care over you is committed, following with a glad mind and will their godly advice? I will do so, the Lord being my helper. Most merciful God, the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Give you grace, we ask. Jonathan, give your grace, we ask, to Jonathan, your servant, now called to this office and ministry, and so equip him with the truth of your doctrine and purity of life, that he may faithfully serve before you to the glory of your great name, and the benefit of your church through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive these books and let them be the rule of your conduct in the exercise of the ministry in which you are called, and be faithful. This is your certificate, of course, which shows exactly uh, where you are to serve and how you are to serve, and of course the blue scarf of office of a reader. Let us pray. Almighty God, who of your great goodness has called Jonathan, Jonathan to this office and ministry, make him, O Lord, to be modest, humble, and constant in his duties, that he, continually ever stable and strong in your Son, Jesus Christ, 
may so well behave himself in his office that he may have great boldness in the faith and good success in his ministry to the honour and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. And that is just about the end of our service this morning. It's been a little bit longer than normal. Thank you for bearing with us, especially to those of you in the hall. Thank you for bearing with us in the cold. We have to keep the doors open, keep some ventilation flowing. And we have to encourage you. Thank you very much for bearing with the restrictions on the normal operation of church. And we have to encourage you again to carry on observing them, not to mingle with anyone outside your household and to vacate uh, as quickly as you can. But the snow has stopped. That is some good news. So as you go outside, the snow seems to have stopped falling. Go on a snowball fight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, as we uh, close our meeting, let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you for Josh and Connor and their clear confession of faith. Please keep them walking faithfully with you for the rest of their lives. Thank you for Johnny. Please continue to lead and guide him in his ministry. May he continue to be a faithful servant for your great glory. Thank you for Bishop Paul. Please strengthen and enable him as he can, carries many responsibilities. And please keep him safe on his journey home. And thank you most of all for the glorious truths we've heard from your word this morning. Of um, grace and grace alone. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen.